All right, let's just look into the word of the Lord. And today is Pentecost Sunday. So we will be dwelling on the subject of the Pentecost. We will be looking more closely at the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Why are we going to look at this? Why? Because at the end of this sermon, I'm just praying that the Spirit of the Lord will fill us. If we are already baptized in the Holy Spirit, I just pray. I just pray that you will flow in the power of the Holy Spirit. But if you are not baptized in the Holy Spirit, but if you are seeking God, if you are hungry and thirsty for more of God, I just pray today. I just pray today that the Spirit of the Lord will come, will infill us, and we will live our life in power. You know, remember, the book of Romans says that those who are led by the Spirit of the Lord, they are the mature children of God. How do we know that we are children of, the, children of the Lord? Because the Spirit bears witness that we are the children of God. And not just that, we are also led by the Spirit of, by the Spirit of God. What we're going to do today is, as an introduction, let me just talk about six events or six people who were baptized in the Holy Spirit or the difference the baptism of the Holy Spirit did in their life. Uh, all from the book of Acts. And then we will look at the gospel according to John. A little teaching about the Holy Spirit from the gospel according to John. And then we will spend time trusting God to fill us with the Holy Spirit. So here we go. The first one, Peter. You will find it in Acts chapter 2. I'm just going chronologically or as they are mentioned in the book of, book of Acts. Peter, on the day of Pentecost... He was baptized in the Holy Spirit. The Bible talks about Peter. Probably he was an illiterate person. And he was a fisherman. And fishermen during those days did not really have that kind of a great status. And they would be stinking most of the time. And a good number of fishermen in those days were fall mouth. You know, before they start a sentence, they would have a vulgar language. And after they finish the sentence, they would still use that in between many times. That's how fishermen were. And the thing about uh, Peter is I kind of identify myself more with Peter than any other disciple of Jesus Christ. And uh, the good thing about Peter is very courageous. He's very radical whenever he has to follow Jesus Christ. He takes the steps which no other disciple takes. But the problem with Peter is that he is fickle-minded. What do you mean by fickle-minded? He's often changing his mind and his loyalties. That's what Peter is. Remember, there was a time when Jesus came walking on the waters. And, you know, Peter had so much faith. said, Jesus, yeah, I also want to walk on the water. So he got out of the boat and he started walking. Everything went on fine. Till he saw the wind and the waves and the sound of the thunder and all. And he started to sink. You know, I like Peter because, you know, Peter had the courage to step out of the boat. All the other disciples are like, you know, we'll be safe mode. But then, Peter, when he looked around everything, he got scared and he started sinking. That's who Peter is. Another instance is, you know, Jesus was asking everybody, who do people say I am? Some say you're a prophet, some say you're a rabbi, that, this and all. Then he looks at Peter and he says, Peter, who do you say I am? Now, Peter says, you're the anointed, you're the Messiah from the Lord. And Jesus is so impressed. Jesus says, says, Flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, Peter. You got a revelation from God himself. And a few verses later, Jesus is talking about his crucifixion. And then Peter takes Jesus aside and he started scolding Jesus, telling, what are you talking, Jesus? You're telling that you want to get crucified or what? Now Jesus gets upset. And he turns around Peter and he says, get thee behind me, Satan. I mean, at one time, he had a great revelation from the Lord. In just a few seconds, he is talking some nonsense. That's who Peter is. I like Peter. Why? Because when Jesus Christ was being tried, when the trial of Jesus was going going on, Peter had the courage to go into those courts just to see Jesus Christ. But the problem with Peter is that he denies Jesus thrice. First of all, he had the courage to go there. But then he says, I don't know who this man is. I don't know who this man is. I don't know who Jesus is. That's who Peter is. 
He's fickle minded. His loyalties keep changing. I guess because of the situations, you know, when everything goes well, he is really on fire for the Lord. But suddenly when he sees situation changing, he is backing off. I think so much like me. Anybody like me? Okay, some of you just laughed, but nobody lifted your hand. Good, it's okay. That's all way better than me. All right. That's who Peter is. You know, once again, you know, when Jesus was talking about his crucifixion, Peter suddenly interrupts it and he says, Jesus, you know, even if all leave you, Jesus, I'm not going to leave you. I will always be faithful to you, always be loyal to, loyal to you. And, you know, Jesus is crucified, laid in the tomb, even after his resurrection, you know, what does Peter does? He goes back to fishing. Where was his loyalty? He goes back to fishing. Jesus has to go, when Jesus fries a fish, give his, gives it to Peter, and then he says, go feed my sheep, men. On the day of Pentecost, this Peter, who was running away, who was switching in his loyalties, this Peter was filled with the Holy Spirit, was baptized in the Holy Spirit. And on that day, he would stand up in front of thousands of people and he would give an expository message from the book of Joel. He says, what you are witnessing is what prophesied in the book of Joel, that the Holy Spirit will be poured out on the last days. The result of that, at least 3,000 people were added to the added to the church. I mean, and then he goes around doing miracle after miracle. Once he heals a person who was lame, he was arrested. Now, if Peter natural character has to show up, he would panic, he would become nervous, and he would break down. But then this is what Peter does. You can find it in Acts chapter 4, verse 8 to 10. I like the way how this sentence begins. It says, then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, rulers, elders of Elders of the people, if we have been called on account today as an act of kindness shown to a man who was lame and are being asked how he was healed, know this then, you and all the people of Israel, it is by the name of Jesus of Nazareth, whom you have crucified. This guy is supposed to be scared. That's his nature. Why is he standing with that kind of a boldness and telling it is in the name of Jesus whom you have crucified. Read the first letter that Peter wrote to the churches in Asia. The epistle of first Peter. All the subject matter of that epistle is, I know you're going through a hard time, but don't give up. God is not going to deliver you, but God will give you strength to go through the hard times. You know, the message is basically, if when the going gets tough, the tough gets Going, that's what he says. He prepares people and he says, consider it an honor when you suffer for the sake of Jesus Christ. Now, this is what church history believes. Church tradition believes that the Mark's gospel, though it was written by John Mark, they say Peter dictated it. Peter spoke it to John and John would later on write that gospel. The church in those days never had a problem accepting this. We can question it now. But if you read Mark's gospel, you will find a Jesus who is facing persecution, who's facing hindrances every now and then, but he's not giving up. He's not giving up. This Peter who would run away from hardships, now he's telling, let's take a stand for Jesus. Even though we suffer, let's take a stand for Jesus. And again, church tradition says that, you know, once he was trying to escape from the city of Rome, escaping persecution, and then Jesus speaks to him. He says, cure what is telling, you know, where are you going, Peter? Then Peter immediately turns around, goes to the epicenter of persecution where the persecution was taking place. And he says, you know, I'm not worthy to die the way Jesus died. And he was crucified upside, upside down. A fickle-minded a scared Peter would suddenly get that boldness and that courage because he was baptized in the Holy Spirit. Let's look at example number two, Stephen. You'll find it in Acts chapter 6, 
That's, the, that's where his name is first mentioned. So there was a problem in the early church. You know, a lot of people say that the early church is the perfect church. We should be like the early church. But if you read the account of the early church, you will be like, God, I thank you we are in this church. Yeah, because the early church also was going through a lot of problems. And over here, it was an issue with the snack. Let's say issue with the meals. One group come and say, you know, they're getting more snacks than us. You know, they're getting more food than more food than us, and all the apostles got together, and they say that, you know, if we have to discuss how many, how much biryani everybody is going to get, we will not be able to do any ministry, so let's, let's gather some people, let them deal with all this. So they come up with what we, we can call as a volunteer team or a hospitality team. The guys who stand over here, who will give you the snacks or pass on that communion, that kind of a volunteer team. And Stephen was one of them. A small job, a small responsibility, and he was faithful in doing that. Nothing great about it, a small thing. But I think, you know, that's the way God actually uses, starts using people. If God wants to use people, he will actually test you with little things first. If you're faithful with the little that God has trusted you with, then he will entrust more. Why should God give you a big work or a big assignment right at the beginning when you don't even prove yourself to be faithful with the little things that he has given you? Stephen was faithful. In fact, the very way the Bible describes him is a man full of faith, man full of the spirit of, spirit of God. Along with that, Along with the volunteer work that he was doing at the church, he was also evangelizing. Just that his evangelism was more radical. I wish our volunteers also do this. Let me read this verse. Acts chapter 6 verse 8. Now Stephen, a man full of God's grace and power, performed great wonders and signs among the people. Wow. He's just a volunteer at the church but perform great signs and wonders among the people. Not just that. Opposition arose, however, from the members of the synagogue of the freedmen, the Jews of Cyrene and Alexandria, as well as the provinces of Cilicia and Asia, who began to argue with Stephen. So when people came and started arguing with Stephen, telling that, you know, Jesus is not God, Jesus is not the Messiah, if he's the Messiah, why was he crucified? And all those arguments... The Bible says, but they could not stand up against the wisdom the Spirit gave Stephen as he spoke. The Spirit of God was upon him so much that whatever he spoke, it was wisdom. It came out with power. Remember, at least thrice in the Bible, Jesus says, when they deliver you to the authorities and you don't know what to speak, don't get scared. Because the spirit of the Lord will come and you will get those words. You will know what to speak. You will know words which they will never be able to, never be able to falsify, never be able to question again. That Holy Spirit was upon Stephen. The next chapter, Acts chapter 7, I like this chapter. You know, if you want to read a Holy Spirit account of the Old Testament in one chapter, read Acts chapter 7, right from Abraham till the resurrection of Jesus, he was filled with the Holy Spirit and he gives a nice account. The entire Old Testament summarized in just one chapter. He speaks, he speaks, and everybody gets agitated, then they stone Peter, I mean Stephen to death, the first martyr of the, martyr of the church. Even when he was being stoned, the Bible says he was filled with the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit showed the throne room of God. He saw God seated on the throne. He was baptized with the Holy Spirit. A normal person who would just do his normal small duties. When he was filled with the Holy Spirit, he became bold, he became powerful. The third one. Now, I like this thing about, you know, the Bible. The Bible talks about this one group of people who were always hated by the Jewish people, the Samaritans. Nobody liked the Samaritans. They were treated like second-class citizens. They had some similarities with the Jewish people, but nobody really liked the Samaritans. 
the Jewish people avoided going to their localities. They avoided talking to a Samaritan. I mean, they just don't like them. They're like one of those backward castes, though, these untouchable people that were there in the society. You will be surprised to find out it is Jesus who actually reached out to the Samaritans. Remember, in John chapter 4, the Bible says that Jesus had to go through Samaria. Jesus goes there, sits at a well, and a Samaritan woman comes and Jesus ministers to her. The result of that, as Jesus talks to her, she goes, shares a story with everybody in the village, and they request Jesus, Jesus, stay back. No Jew will stay back in Samaria. But Jesus stayed three days. Many people came to know who Jesus Christ is. And not just that, you will also find, you know, I mean, people never use Samaritans as good examples. If you have to, you have been talk good about a Samaritan, that means your mind is like, you know, really gone. But Jesus uses Samaritan as a good example. Jesus talks about a Samaritan. In Luke chapter 10, Jesus talks about a Jewish person who was beaten up, robbed, left to die. The priest comes, the Levite comes, or the great religious people come. What do they do? They just pass. But who comes to help that person? The Samaritan. We find it as the parable of the good Samaritan. And Jesus speaks it to the Jewish people and he says, whatever the Samaritan did, do it. Do it to everybody around you. The Jewish people are like, how can you tell us to follow Samaritans? What are you telling me? Jesus reached out to the Samaritans. I think this, because Jesus reached out to the Samaritans, after the Pentecost, when the disciples were baptized with the Holy Spirit, they started spreading around. Why? Because Jesus said, the day you are filled with the Holy Spirit, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea. And what is the third one? Samaria. So Philip goes. Philip the evangelist goes to Samaria and he starts preaching. And the Samaritans are receiving the word of the Lord. They're receiving the gospel. They're receiving Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. And I think there was so much of a revival. Philip sends news to Jerusalem telling, man, something amazing is happening in Samaria. Now this is how the Bible reads. Acts chapter 8 verse 14. When the apostles in Jerusalem heard that Samaria had accepted the word of the Lord, they sent Peter and John to Samaria. When they arrived, they prayed for the new believers there that they might receive the Holy Spirit. Because the Holy Spirit had not yet come on any of them. They had simply been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Then Peter and John, they placed their hands on them and they received the Holy Spirit. Wow. You know, till the time the Jewish people always treated the Samaritans as somebody who's not part of them. But since the church began, church had no problem, absolutely no problem welcoming the Samaritans into their congregations, into their fellowships. Why? The proof is that they have not just received the word of the Lord, but they are also baptized in the Holy Spirit. Then the church at Jerusalem, Peter and John, and maybe Philip also would stand and say, let's welcome the Samaritans. Let's welcome them into our fellowships. No Jew would do that, but the church did that. I like this about the church because I believe when you come into the presence of the Lord, when we receive Jesus as Lord and Savior, our background doesn't matter. Where we come from, what we are, what is our history, doesn't matter. Jesus takes care of it. We all become the children of God. No caste, no tribe, no linguistic background, no regional background. All of us become the children of, children of God. The church received the Samarians or the Samaritans because the Holy Spirit also came upon them. Let's look at the next one. You'll find it in Acts chapter 9. I like, you know, I mean, I'm talking very less about this person, but nevertheless, let me prove my point. The church was scared of this fellow. 
This guy was danger. He is a radical. He is passionate. He is an expert in his field. He studied under somebody called Gamaliel. And later on, he says, I am not a Pharisee, not just a Pharisee. I am the Pharisee of the, the Pharisee. He says, I'm somebody man. And what was his zeal? In his zeal, he persecuted the church. He would catch hold of Christians and he would deliver them to the courts to be punished. You know, the first mention of his name is in context of the martyrdom of Stephen. When Stephen was being stoned to death, everybody took off their robes and they placed it in the custody of this one person and that person is Saul. And he figured out that as persecution in Jerusalem is increasing, the church started dispersing. They started hiding. They started going to different cities. And a good number of Christians went to Damascus, Syria. And this fellow comes to know about them. He takes a group of people and tries to go to Damascus in order to arrest the Christians over there. But on the way, he has an encounter. Jesus appears. And what happens is, when Jesus says, you know, why are you persecuting me, man? Then he receives Jesus as Lord and Savior. He best becomes blind. I think, you know, when Jesus' glory was so powerful, he just becomes blind. So for three days, he stays at a place. And then Jesus talks to another prophet called Ananias. And he says, Ananias, go there. Saul is over there and you need to pray for Saul. And Ananias, though he's a prophet, he's listening to the words of God, words of Jesus. Ananias says, God, what are you thinking? That fellow persecutes everybody. That fellow is behind all of us and you want me to go and uh, go and go minister to him or what? Ananias still goes. And when he prays over Saul, I mean, the Bible tells that, you know, something like scales just fell off his face. He was able to see his sight was restored and he was baptized in the Holy Spirit. And something wonderful happens. You know, I believe the church or the Christians in Damascus, they were praying for Saul. They knew that Saul is on the way and they started praying and God answered their prayers. But Saul did go to Damascus. He wanted to go to Damascus in order to arrest the Christians and deliver them to be punished. The Bible says he did go to Damascus. In Acts chapter 9, it says, Paul spent several days with the disciples in Damascus. But he doesn't go there to persecute. This is what Paul does. He says, at once he began to preach in the synagogues that Jesus is the son of God. And all those who heard him were astonished and they asked, isn't he the man who raised havoc in Jerusalem among those who call on the name of Jesus? And hasn't he come here to take them as prisoners to the chief priests? And this fellow left Jerusalem in order to arrest us, in order to persecute us. But why is he talking about Jesus Christ here? What happened in between? Yet, Saul grew more and more powerful and baffled the Jews living in Damascus by proving that Jesus is the Messiah. He started out thinking that I will prove that Jesus is not the Messiah. And everybody who believes Jesus is the Messiah, I'm going to put them in the jail. But then... When he finally ended up in Damascus, he's like, Jesus is the Messiah, man. And the Christians were like, oh my God, what happened? I don't know, some of us might be kind of, you know, I mean, we are opposing the gospel. Maybe not the way Paul used to, I mean, or Saul used to do, but you're opposing the will of God. But I'm sure you will have an encounter with Jesus. What you resist now, that you will propagate very soon. That you will stand for very soon. That's what happens when the Holy Spirit comes upon, comes upon you. Let's look at the next one. You will find it in Acts chapter 10. This is Cornelius and his, and his household. The Bible talks about Cornelius. Cornelius is a Roman citizen. He's neither a Jew nor a Samaritan. He's just a Roman. And people in those days, especially the Israelites, the Jewish people never liked the Romans. Because the Romans were the colonizers. They were the occupiers. 
they were in charge and people just hated the Romans with all their heart. The Jewish people are fiercely independent. You cannot colonize them for a long time. They will revolt, they will fight, but they will maintain their independence. No Roman fellow was ever respected. Even in fact, you will find in the Bible that no Roman is ever taken by, a, by their names, especially that centurion category. This guy was a centurion. You know, elsewhere in the gospels, there was also a Roman centurion whom Jesus really commended for his faith. He comes to Jesus and he says that Jesus, my servant is sick. Just say a word, he'll be well. The Bible just says he's a Roman centurion. That's all. Over here, it talks about a Roman centurion by name. By name, Cornelius. Cornelius was a good man. He was generous and he was a prayerful man. Not just him, but his entire household. Suddenly an angel is talking to Cornelius and the angel says, go to Joppa and over there you will find Peter. Tell him to come. He will talk about me. Talk about God. And at the same time, Peter is having this. He goes into a trance. Three times he gets this vision. You know, blanket comes from heaven and the blanket has all kinds of animals. Clean and clean. And the word that he gets is, get up and eat. And Peter is like, I'm sure like, you know, we would have said, okay, God, let's have a barbecue. But Peter is like, you know, God, this is unclean. How can I? How can I eat? Then the word says, what God has created, do not call it unclean. Peter just doesn't understand. Now, this thing happened midday, not during the morning or not during the night. Happened midday. When Peter gets an invitation from Cornelius, when he goes to his house, that's when it dawns on him. God is telling, now there is no difference called Jew and a Gentile. Jesus is telling, in my church, everybody is welcome. And how does God go about proving it? When Peter was just giving the gospel message, they were filled with the Holy Spirit. And how do you know they were filled with the Holy Spirit? They started speaking in tongues, prophesying and praising the name of God. And when they saw it, they understood. They understood that now the gates of the church has been opened to all of humankind. It's not the Jew, not just the Samaritan. It is for everybody. You can come and be part of the church of, church of God. Believe me, doesn't matter whether you're black, white, brown, yellow, whatever. We are all the family of God, amen? You know, in fact, you know, I like our Hope Unlimited churches because, you know, we get people from different backgrounds. And if you're thinking only Telugu people will worship God in heaven or Tamil people or Malayali people, nah. Heaven will have all of us, Right? And if you want to experience a bit of heaven, we need to learn how to worship God with different people from different backgrounds, right? Because in heaven, you will have a hard time adjusting if you worship only with your gang. Yeah, because in heaven, you will find all kinds of people, every nation, tongue, and tribe. So if you want to really enjoy heaven, worship with different kinds of people. Worship different styles of worship because that's what we will be in heaven. The Holy Spirit powerfully throws open the doors of the church to anybody, anywhere in the world. You know, if this thing never really happened, I think Christians would still would be kind of telling that, you know, it's only for Jewish people. It's only for Jewish people. Church or message of Jesus, it's only for Jewish people. But here, but here, the message is powerful. Do not stop anybody from receiving the message, the gospel of Jesus Christ. Let's come to the next one. The disciples at Ephesus. Oh, I like this thing. Ephesus is a great city. It was the capital of the province of Asia or else let's say Turkey or Turkey, whichever way you announce, under, uh, pronounce it. And it is a city that is dedicated to the worship of a goddess called Artemis. A lot of witchcraft, a lot of soothsaying and a lot of magicians would uh, be in that city. You know, the Greek and the Roman empires were built mostly on magicians, prophets, on black magic. That's how they built these empires. You know, before the Romans especially, before they went to, the, went to any war or any ex expedition, 
they would take actually some animals, they would cut them open, and they would cut open their livers, and they would look at them and prophesy whether you will, be, you will win in the war or no. How did they understand it? No, but, but that was a popular method in those, in those days. I mean, the, the only thing I know about the liver is it tastes good. <laughs> but these guys would cut open the liver and they would say that you will win. You will get married. She's the right person. How do you know that, man? But they built an empire on those kind of things. You know, we also build empires, right? I mean, we, we, we also fashion our lives with those things, no? Some of us look at the tarot card. Some of us look at that palm thing, the zodiac signs in the papers. And, you know, some of us look at the hand and say, you will get married twice. Really? <laughs> Does it say anything like that? The city was given over to that. And the Bible says in Acts chapter 19 that there were just 12 people. 12 people who understood the Jewish scriptures. They studied very well the Jewish scriptures, but they were still not baptized in the Holy Spirit. So Paul goes to Ephesus and Paul starts talking to them. I'm sure these people were feeling a little bad because they're just surrounded. It's not like Jerusalem where everybody is like God-fearing. Everybody reads the Torah. Everybody is worshiping Yahweh. This is Ephesus, man. There are thousands of people and all of them are doing idolatry. All of them are doing witchcraft and they felt suffocated. Yet they held on to the scriptures. So when Paul came and said, are you baptized in the Holy Spirit? They said, you know, we never heard anything like that. He gives a little teaching and he lays hands on them. And those 12 people are baptized in the, they are baptized in the Holy Spirit. Just fast forward the history of this city. It becomes the third important city in Christendom. Jerusalem, Antioch, and the third was Ephesus. Nearly half of the books of the New Testament have something to do with the city of Ephesus. Either the authors wrote from, wrote to, or some way connected to the city of Ephesus. Some of the greatest Christian leaders went down and settled in Ephesus. Paul stayed there for at least two, two and a half years. John the beloved, he also made Ephesus his headquarters. Mary the mother of Jesus was also in Ephesus. Later on you will find a great church is established in Ephesus. Not just that, Timothy also stays at Ephesus for a good amount of time. And then Onesimus, you know, if you know Philemon and his slave Onesimus, Onesimus becomes the bishop of the city of Ephesus. Or let's say 150 years after the book of Ephesians was written, the whole city becomes a Christian city. They forsake idolatry, they forsake everything, and they become a Christian city. Twelve people who were struggling, they got baptized in the Holy Spirit. Not much of them is known. But I'm sure from then on, a mighty revival took place. They thought they were a minority, but when the Holy Spirit came upon them, the entire city turned to Jesus. Let's look at gospel according to John. All of this started because of the promise that God gave. In the last days, I will pour out my spirit. In the book of Acts chapter 1 and 2, you will see the fulfillment of it. They received power. And then they started becoming witnesses. You know, before we look at that, you know, let me also tell you the book of Acts is written just to show you that nothing stops the church of God. It started on the day of Pentecost and the promise that is given to the church is Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, uttermost parts of the world. Every now and then in the book of Acts, you will find there is persecution, there is opposition, there is hardship, there is discouragement, but every now and then you will also read verses which say that, and the word of the Lord spread and the church grew. The word of the Lord spread and the Lord added to the church. I think Luke, when he wrote this book, all he was trying to say is, man, the Holy Spirit birthed the church on that day and nothing just stops it. Till the ends of the world, are reached nothing stops the advance of the church 
you can stand up, you can persecute, you can kill, you can make fun of, you can taunt the church, you can speak your weird philosophies against the church. Nothing stops. Nothing stops the cause of Jesus Christ. Let's come to John. John talks about the Holy Spirit. I like John because of the teaching that he gives about the Holy Spirit. Very quickly, I'll just look at the four four sentences where John uses the word parakletos or in our English Bible they are translated as the advocate parakletos meaning para plus kalio somebody who's called alongside to help us the first time John uses it in chapter 14 verse 16 he says and I will ask the father and he will give you another advocate to help you and to be with you forever that's what the Holy Spirit does you know, none of us like to be alone. You know, every now and then we want to have a me time, just some little time alone. But that's about it. On a long-term basis, nobody likes to be alone. You know, if you're somebody like, you know, oh, no, I will be alone. and all, You'll go home and cry, man. <laughs> nobody wants to be alone. Especially when we go through bad times in our life, we want somebody to talk to. We want to share those burdens with somebody. You know, Jesus was going through his anxious moments. And when Jesus was going through them, what did Jesus do? He called three of his friends. Remember the Garden of Gethsemane? He had friends. He shared his problems with the friends. The Holy Spirit is with us. He will never leave us. Over here, I like he will be with you forever. Forever. I like this because God is with me all the time. The second time, but the, uh, John chapter 14, verse 26, but the advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said. You know, 166 times in the Bible, the word remember is mentioned. That is on an average once every two days. Because I think, you know, we need to be reminded. It's not that we don't understand. We understand things well and good. I think, but the problem with us is that we constantly need to be reminded of our priorities, of what we should be doing, what is important to us, what is not important to us. Who does that? The Holy Spirit of God. You know, we read the Bible, we understand the Bible, but we have to be reminded what we read or what we have understood. You know, Samuel Johnson, he's the one who authored the Dictionary of the English Language, 755, when he, is the year when he authored. And he made a statement like this. He says, people need to be reminded more often than they need to be instructed. We constantly need to be reminded, especially when we are going wayward. You know, because I think, you know, our mind tends to go astray. We tend, you know, if something is nice, good, catchy, you know, I mean, we just refocus on them. And we need the Holy Spirit to say that, no man, that's not important, come back. The third time, John chapter 15, verse 26. When the advocate comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth who goes out from the Father, he will testify, testify about me. That's what the Holy Spirit does. If you want to know about Jesus Christ, if you want to know about God, if you want to know about the scripture, Invite the Holy Spirit into your life. Now think about this. You know, I, I, I use the Google Maps a lot. But then, you know, not all the times Google Maps works well, right? Our experience, pakka. You know, one of my friends told me, like, you know, just come to my house. And like, you know, it, the Google Maps took me and, you know, it took me to a graveyard. <laughs> and I'm like, you know, man, I'm standing at the location. He says, that's right. <laughs> no, 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 the Google Map, it, it, it was somewhere else in the next lane. And back in the, at least now we have Google Maps. Back in the day, it was just a map, a paper map. Who do you want? You like to use a paper map or the Google Maps or when you have a guide who knows everything. When you want to understand the Bible, who do you want? You want to use a commentary that there's nothing wrong with that. But what about the Holy Spirit? It's written under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Let the author guide us. Let the author teach us. And the fourth one, John chapter 16, verse 7. But very truly I tell you, 
it is for your good I'm going away. Unless I go away, the advocate will not come to you. But if I go, I will send the Holy Spirit, the advocate to advocate to you. In the sense, the mission continues till the ends of the world are reached. Till we find purpose and meaning in our life, God is never really going to abandon us. Now, very quickly, how do I need to receive the Holy Spirit? What should I be doing in order to be filled with the Holy Spirit? Number one, just thirst. Just thirst. Have that desire. God will not do anything in your life if you do not have that desire. He will not force himself on you. If you have the desire, the Lord will honor the desire. The more you hunger after God, thirst after God, you will be filled. If you say, God, I want to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Believe me, more than us wanting, God wants to fill us with the Spirit. God wants to be involved in our life, in our day-to-day -day lives. Start with a hunger, start with a thirst, and then just ask in faith. Ask in faith. Remember Jesus said, ask and you will receive. Seek and you will, and you will find. Jeremiah 29, 13 says, when you seek me, you will find me when you seek me with all of your heart. You know, how close we are to God is up to us. What we fill our hearts with is up to us. If we are desperate for our God, he will fill us. You know, it's like, you know, you take a person, put him under water. You know, the way he's desperate for a gasp of air. It's like, God, I need you. I need you to be in my life. And the next one is just an act of faith. Receive. Receive. God will give his Holy Spirit. Just have the faith to receive. You know, often I found people have issues with this. Because, you know, I also never really kind of, you know, received. Why? Because I thought, you know, why will God give it to me? Because I sinned a lot. I messed up my life a lot. Why will God fill me with this Holy Spirit when there is so many mistakes in my life? I'm struggling with so many issues in my life. But then I found out that God does not fill or God doesn't think about that. God looked at my desire. God looked at my desire to come close to him, to know him more. And he gladly gave. You know, the people of Corinth, they never had a great character. They had messed up lives. But they were filled with the Holy Spirit because they just had that faith. You know, they understood that they do not have to qualify to receive the Holy Spirit. They know, they, they, they lived horrible lives. So all the secret they understood is, if God is giving it freely to me, I'll just take it. Just take it. Don't let the devil speak about your past to you telling because of your past, the Holy Spirit will not come upon you. No, that's not true. The fourth one is just surrender to God. Surrender to God. Come, let's just stand in the presence of the Lord today. In the next few minutes, you know, we will open up ourselves to God. I don't really know where you stand. I don't really know which of those categories that you fall in. Maybe you're like Peter, fickle-minded, your loyalties are here or there. They're ever-changing. Maybe you don't really have the courage to follow Jesus Christ. You just have a zeal. You just have a desire to follow Jesus Christ, not the guts to follow him. Maybe you're like Stephen telling that, I can do the small things in church, but I don't feel qualified to do anything big for the Lord. Or maybe you're like Cornelius. Telling God, I have everything in life, but I'm not really close to you, God. Or maybe you're like the Samaritans. Everybody hates me. Nobody really looks good. Nobody really treats me nicely. This is the category that I'm coming from. This is the background that I have, God. Can you do something about it? Or maybe you're like the efficient believers. I'm a minority, God. Around my house, there is witchcraft. Every day I listen to things which dishonor your name. But I'm just passionate about you. I'm the only guy standing in my household. Why don't we just open up ourselves as an act of surrender to our Lord, as an act of yielding to the Lord. Can we just lift up our hands? Some of you really struggled in your life. Some of us even seen 
that those who are baptized in the Holy Spirit, they're living powerful life. Might not be holy life, but they're effective in whatever they do. You have seen it. You have seen churches which are just growing because they're, they believe in the gifts of the Holy Spirit. They operate in healing. They operate in deliverance. They prophesy. They do all of these things and they're very effective. You have seen people who get visions, who get word from the Lord, who explain the scripture much better than what we know. And you are yearning, telling God, I also want to come more closer to you, God. I just want to know you more. I just want to know you more. I just don't want to do life alone. Remember, he's the paraclete. He will be with us all the time. He will strengthen us. He will lead us and he will guide us. Then why journey along, my brother? When, why do this journey all by yourself, my sister? Let the Spirit of God guide us. Why live a weak life when God's Spirit is there to empower us? Why live an ineffective life when the gifts of the Spirit is going to take us into another level of maturity? Let's just seek after God and say, God, my heart is open, O oh Lord. I'm willing, O oh God, I want to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit today, O oh God. Like on the day of Pentecost, O oh Lord, I am looking up to you, O oh God, hungry and thirsty for more of you, O oh God. I ain't perfect, O oh Lord. I ain't perfect. I'm issues. I got issues. I'm dealing with them, O oh Lord. I messed up in my past, O oh Lord. Even now, nothing really good, looks good. But God, I'm yielding to you. I'm surrendering to you, O oh Lord. Pick me up, O oh God, from wherever I am. Whatever you can do, O oh God, through a broken vessel like this, go ahead and do, O oh Lord. Go ahead and do, O oh Lord. Come, let's just open up our hearts and say, God, fill me with your spirit, O oh Lord. Fill me with your spirit, O oh Lord Jesus. Oh, bless you, Jesus. Bless you, O oh Lord.